presented a new book that is a subject of the workshop he will cover today. Mark? Thank you very much. Thank you for a lovely welcome. Now, I'm, uh, I'm keen that you actually talk to each other rather than just listen to me. So can I ask you please to come and, and join me over here towards the front because uh, it makes it more useful for you and more pleasant for me to see the whites of your eyes. Don't worry if at any point you feel like you have to run for your lunch. Quite understand. The way we're going to do this is um, we have an hour for this slot and I want to give you a flavour of both the theory and the practice. So if, when we get to the end of the theory bit, you go, uh -huh, I'm done, running now for lunch, that's OK, I won't be offended. But if you do, you'll miss out on, on the really practical stuff um, that makes a big difference in this way of working. So um, I'll put that to one side, because I don't need that. I've got a lapel mic. Uh, where shall we start? So we'll start there. So this is the book I've just published, and it is, unlike most people who write books like this, I write books when I finish doing the work. I don't sit down and get, take a commission from a publisher and go, yeah, and I'm going to do the research now and make, it, make sense of it. This is what I've been doing for the last few years. So most of the things in here are quite useful. Uh, they've been road tested, in other words. Uh, I've got a few of these to give away later, depending on who wins the games we play. So play a few games. Um, but I want to start by this. I'm a copycat. It's hard to say. I'm a copycat. It's not something that we're comfortable with in our culture. I'm a copycat. All my ideas belong to other people. I'm a copycat. But then so are you. One of the great things about human beings that I've been writing about for the last decade is that uh, we, are, we, we are essentially homo mimicus. It's our central learning style, is to learn from other people, being a social creature. This is Andy Meltzoff from the 70s. You can tell by the haircut. Some of us remember fondly haircuts like that. Um, and he, he was um, instrumental in developing uh, our understanding of how, how infants learn. And he would go into maternity wards and so on. Uh, I'm not sure that would be allowed nowadays, actually. But he, he went into the maternity wards uh, and made faces at small infants. And his research team recorded what he did. And then what, the, what the, uh, the infant did in response. And he discovered that human beings copy as early as 42 minutes from birth. 42 minutes from birth. Second, he discovered they go on copying. Vast amount of literature here. And they, they go on copying and they do it better than our closest relatives, because clearly there's some cross-species comparisons being done here. <laughs> so we really are a copying machine. If you spend any time with kids at all, you'll know that that's what they do. All those cuss words that you don't want your parents to hear, they will repeat them for you. They'll learn from you, they'll learn from each other, they'll learn from their peers, they'll learn from TV, they'll learn from the man in the street. They do it by copying, copy, 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 copy. And it'd be great to say that if we got to puberty and it suddenly changed, right, like that. Or 21, you get the keys to the door, and you go, that's it, I'm finally a grown-up. I can drink and I don't copy anymore, but we don't. It's still our number one, number one learning style, and it impacts all kinds of ways in our lives. So, uh, I was going to play the long clip to this movie, but you'll recognise this from When Harry Met Sally. Mm -hmm. yeah. I've played this around the world and, and seen some people upset by it, um, and some people go, what's that then? You'll, you'll uh, remember the scene, Harry and Sally, that's Billy and Meg, have been dating, but they aren't anymore. They're in a diner um, in uh, the Lower East Side, and she's mad at him about the way he treats women. And so she, she says, you don't know the difference between a fake and a real female orgasm. And so she, that's what she's doing there, hollering and whooping. And at the end of the scene uh, is actually the director's mother, is the lady of a certain age who's sitting at the next table who leans across the waiter and says, I'll have what she's having. <laughs> now, that for me, we, it was so good, we, we copied it for the, um, the title of our, our, a book I did with a couple of anthropology and archaeology professors um, for MIT a few years ago. I'll have what she's having. Um, it's just so important. And like so many, the, 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 the deli is quite a good, I think, um, example of how many choices in our lives as consumers are 
made with this I'll have what she's having. The choices are many, not A or B or C. The result of a bad choice is unlikely to be death, as it might have been on the savannah in, you know, in early human history. Most of the choices are pretty good. Unless you've got a food allergy or some kind of sensitivity, which you know about, you go, if it's got nuts in it, no. I can't have that. If it's got saffron, allergic to that, whatever. We know that stuff, we can avoid it. You've got religious guidelines as well. So that's also a consideration. But it's, you're faced with so many choices, all of which are good. How do you choose? Well, I don't know about you, but I tend to have menu envy wherever I eat. That seems like a really good idea, what I've just chosen, but I've just seen something coming out of the kitchen to the table. That, oh, that looks really good. And those people, over, what have they got? I, I, can I have one of those? If you ever worked in a bar, you'll know that the way to get people to drink the drink or have the food that you have been told to sell is this. Get one of a group to do it. <laughs> and then the rest of the group will say, oh, gin and tonic, what a great idea. Gin and, oh, yeah, Gordon and Schwebs, what a great idea. I haven't had a gin and tonic for ages. The gin and tonic. I'll have a gin and tonic too. I'll have a gin and tonic. Gin and tonic. Gin and tonic? Yes, gin and tonic. So that's how it works. Now, this isn't just, you know, for choices like um, what do we eat or what do we drink, but it affects lots of other things. And uh, the UK government has got the largest group of uh, social scientists working on um, developing and testing policy um, to see what actually works. And this was the conclusion of their mid midterm report two years ago, which is... The most important influence on an individual's behavior is the behavior of others. Sure, what they say, but most importantly, what other people are doing. I'll have what she's having. It's just such an important driver. And it's the second most important heuristic after what I did last time. So it's just really, really important. I'm going to show it's not just important in shaping those kind of choices, but it's also, um, and lots of choices that we wouldn't think it would shape, like the names we give our children. My mother was convinced because she was typing the word Deutschmark thousands and thousands of times when she was pregnant with me. She was a translator. Um, and uh, she was convinced that that's why I had to be called Mark. <laughs> the truth is, if you look at the popularity of the name Mark in the British population, it peaks in 1961. <laughs> <laughs> it just happened to be a fashion thing, like so many of these things. So even the most important things you think, like giving the name to the child, at, they're going to suffer for the rest of their lives, uh, is that. But it's also really important to have things spread. And we kind of know this now instinctively from working in, in the online space. And so we're just going to demonstrate this now with a little game. So do you all stand up, please? And I want you to uh, turn to the person nearest you. And I want you to sort yourself into pairs, basically. So if you get pairs, twos, if there's one on their own, then put your hand up. Have you got, there's one, yeah, were you two here okay? Now, apologize to the Brits in the room. I know there are two here. Uh, I'm going to do something you're going to really hate me for. I'm going to ask you to hold that person's hands. <laughs> Physical contact for the Brits is just the most <laughs> awful thing. So hold the two hands, turn and face them. Okay. So the, this game is really simple. If you'll just put the microphone down, that's it, lovely. Uh, the sim really simple game, really simple objective. The objective is to get your partner off the ground as many times as you can. Get your partner off the ground as many times as you can. Go! <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. Very good, very good. Very good. Very good. So, okay, so that, you, were, you were super smart and super speedy. I've seen, it took 10 minutes, to 10 minutes, 10 seconds the other day for a, a bunch of Swiss uh, social scientists to not quite get this. But what happens here is there are about three steps. The first of which is this, what the WTF, as young people say. What? What? And then there's a little bit of wrestling. Now, there's a, there's a tiny bit of wrestling here, but not very much. I did want to see a Norwegian crowd throw someone across the room, but... <laughs> That's just to confirm international stereotyping. And then the third thing that happens is somebody starts jumping. And they may have done it before, it may seem obvious, but within seconds of that person doing it, I counted two seconds that the majority of you were bouncing up and down. It's a really nice solution, it's probably the best one, and, and it emerges every time. 
but it went around the room because people saw someone else doing it. It's not like an important decision. What do I do in this game? It's not life or death. You know, fortune depending on this choice. <laughs> just do it. Oh, that seems okay. That's just that's, yeah, fine. But it spread that way. And so copying is really, really important. We know this from the work of, ever, um, of Rogers and so on, um, uh, from the, and Bass from the 50s and 60s. It's really, really important. How things get spread is through people copying them, mostly. Mostly. There are some exceptions, but that's it. So this is what I've been doing for the last 10 years. I've been banging on about this stuff. And I've been working with um, uh, any number of corporations. And they've been saying to me, look, so an organization, so, so what do we do different then? And we go, well, you know, uh, yes, do this, do this, do this. And you know, I've had interesting conversations with everyone from Greenpeace, the intelligence communities, NATO, um, corporations like Unilever and Experian and, and uh, Sony and so on. It's very interesting. Interesting times. But it occurred to me that whilst it's just about acceptable now to say human beings copy each other, consumers, people out there, little people out there in the world who buy our products, they copy each other. And that's a, that's a good thing to know. When we look at ourselves as insights monsters, we don't think about ourselves in the same way. We don't apply copying in the same way as readily as, as easily. We tend to think about, you know, this is, I remember from being at, at, at college, those late night sessions with too much coffee. And I was a heavy smoker at the time, so too much coffee and holding my head, just thinking through it. That's how we tend to think about it, as if, some, as if getting a good insight was something you did on your own. Yes, sir? Not at all. Yeah, yeah. I think it's very strong in our culture, it's particularly Anglo-Saxon culture, which Northern Europe and, and North America find particularly strong. Not all cultures accept it, but, um, but we do like the idea of the individual. And we, yeah. the idea that somebody who isn't in possession of their own ideas, who makes their own decisions, is, is just uncomfortable for us because they're not like us. When, when, so it's a, it's a, because we've got a cult of an individual. The individual is all. It's the ultimate. Yep. Okay. Yep. Why would you start by thinking that it's about how would a culture develop suggesting individuality is better than the reality of copying while other cultures Because there are some really good things to c that come with it. Some really good things that come with it. You know, for example, how we organise ourselves politically. Democracy is built on the idea of individuals having a choice, not groups of people having a choice. Okay. And we go to great extent to make that happen. So you're gonna make a comment. You know, it's so interesting. I don't think that because no. the way kids learn is, you know, first of all, if I smile at you as a researcher, I know you're going to more likely smile at me. So sure. you're going to get empathy right away. Sure. Um, if I see you're aloof, I'll lean back, and that's more how I'll connect with you. So um, that's more human interaction yep. than independence versus copying. I think people just don't like the label. But no, 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 I'm being very the, provocative. The, the, so, the so suggestibility, I mean, of course, if you say you're having roast beef, I'm thinking, hmm, roast beef. That sounds good. That sounds good. <laughs> but that doesn't mean I'm not independent. It just means roast beef sounds good. But it all, I mean, yeah, I know, absolutely. So the word copying I deliberately use. In some languages, it's, oh, hello. <laughs> very dramatic. Yeah, I feel like I'm in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, so in some cultures, for example, in languages, for example, in German, the word kopieren, same root, is very, very strong. And I, in English, it's less provocative, but still quite provocative. Social scientists have a number of words for it, like, for example, social learning is the acceptable one, social learning. It's a nice euphemism for essentially the same thing. And I use the word copying because I want us to be clear about it, and I want us not to run away from this stuff. And, and it depends on context, exactly. And just because you choose in this circumstance on the basis of what other people are doing doesn't mean in every circumstance you do the same. Right. Even in the same category. Next time you might, <laughs> might choose independently. But the point, is, the point is there. When we look at ourselves as professionals, we don't see ourselves in the same way we see humans. It's just in the same way that the cognitive biases that we've, behavioral economics has put out for us in making decisions, we see out there with consumers, we don't see ourselves as being subject to the same cognitive biases, or we find it hard to accept. 
my point here is, look, if you want to get insights, don't just try and do it on your own. Why not use the brains, the efforts, the successes of other people to start with? <laughs> you could be, do it on your own. You could be lucky. You could be a genius. But most of us aren't. And even the geniuses, we'll see, uh, in both the creative world and innovation, do copying as their, their mainstay. Um, I'll tell you a story now. So this is Professor Martin Elliott at Great Ormond Street Hospital in London. He is one of the world's leading paediatric heart surgeons. So he does that amazing surgery on you know, tiny kids who are less than two weeks old. And this kind of surgery takes 10 hours or more. It's exhausting. And when I first met him, he was telling me that during his 30-year career as a surgeon, fatality rates, mortality rates had gone down. Fatality rates, so that's the ones that die, uh, on the table or just after. Um, had gone down from something like 90% down to early teens. So that's a phenomenal improvement, right, in 30 years of practice. But he still wanted to reduce that further down, as you would, right? You wouldn't say, it's OK, yeah, one in 10. So he wanted to, move it, wanted to improve it. Now, he did a review of what his peers were up to, looked for best practice around the world, and there was no obvious thing. Apart from the else, there was no agreed measure of what a good outcome was. There's no standard. Even, you know, even the leading centres in the world, you think like John Hopkins, might, might have set the standard everyone else copies. They can't agree amongst themselves what a good outcome is and how to measure it. So there's not much help there, uh, but he's very thorough. So he, he spent quite a lot of time, a number of years, looking at that stuff. And after one hard day's operating, he, was, uh, he found himself slumped in front of the TV watching the Formula One racing highlights. And he's a bit of a geek about Formula One. And he had one of those moments that we, we all hope to have in our lives, where you go, ah, that's the thing. And his that the thing, that's the thing moment was when he realized he didn't have a medical problem he was struggling with. He had a handover problem. We looked at the pit stops in Formula One. And being a geek about Formula One, he knew that 30 years ago, pit stops took how long? Two minutes, five minutes. Five minutes is quite common. And it was really common, like once in every three races, that there would be a, a, a fatality or a critical accident as a result of an error in the pit stop. Whereas nowadays, pit stops take how long? Yeah, seconds. Five seconds is, is not that fast, right? And how, how many accidents are there as a result of pit stops? Apart from driver error, where the driver comes out in the, from the pit lane in the wrong way. You never hear about them, almost eradicated. So it's, a, so it's a handover. They've learned to reduce error, human error here, dramatically. And he said, so it's the handover moment between surgery and ICU. That's the thing that we could, we've never addressed before. No one's ever thought about it. And so he worked with, first of all, McLaren, and then he spent a very happy nine months working with Ferrari. <laughs> As he would imagine, it's a dream thing. Um, and identified a protocol, which he then prototyped and tested, which is now the standard amongst heart surgeons around the world, not just for pediatrics. And immediately, the immediate reduction in humor was 42%. Immediate. Now, this is phenomenal. And, and of course, you all know this because you are avid subscribers to pediatric anesthesia. Um, <laughs> if, you ever, if you ever think we don't do very good diagrams, then consider this from a major, oh, sorry, this is a tiny academic journal. On the left-hand side, clearly, you see the, the, the racing car on the right-hand side. Similar thing. So and a very vulnerable individual stuck between all these people with specialists, uh, tubes, wires, and so on connected to each other. So, so that was his thing. And that's what I mean by copying creates real insight. Copying creates real insight and makes real change. And why not go there first? This kind of way of thinking is different from how we as insights professionals think, because it asks different questions of the subject matter. Not different question of the subject, but different question of the subject matter. What kind of thing is this? What kind of thing? Not what thing is this, not how big, how small, how tall, how green, how blue. What kind of thing is this? And what kind of strategies, what kind of interventions, what kind of stuff works in other contexts? And it's important to ask both of those questions, I think, rather than just the one. 
we as professionals do like the idea of insights being something mined, dug about, dig deep. When was the last time I said, I've got a really, really shallow insight here? <laughs> we flatter ourselves, don't we? Deep insights. And that we dig deep, normally inside someone's head. Right? Inside someone, inside someone. It's going to be in there. It's going to be in the people, in the respondents, normally. That's where we find the insight. And we also, like a teenager, imagine this is the first and only time this problem has ever been faced by anyone. Teenagers, of course, are always the first time they're in love. No one else has ever experienced anything like this, ever. And I hate you. Sorry, that's yeah. just the teenagers in my life say to me. Say to me. Um, yeah, so the singularity of the problem is we allow this fiction. And we know it's not true. Because the more you've worked in insights the, over the years, the more you know, I've seen this before. My old boss used to say, OK, who's up for resegmenting the pickles market this year? Um, you know, we've done this task again and again and again. Um, but, we, uh, but we do treat it as if it was singular. And it's very flattering for us. It's very flattering for the client because only this singular problem, it needs it's a great client to do this. And it takes, it takes superheroes of the, of, of the singularity to really solve. Really great brains, really great technicians and really inspired people to, to really solve singular problems such as this. And I think those two things combined really get in the way of us doing this copying thing as insights professionals. And let me challenge you with this. This is Grayson Perry, uh, who's a transvestite, award-winning transvestite ceramicist. Um, and he represents a view that's widely held across all the greats in the creative world, that originality is for the birds. Copying is the central mechanic of what it is to be creative. Picasso famously said, of course, that, that um, talent copies, genius steals. T.S. Eliot famously says, it's not whether you copy, it's how you copy that distinguishes a good poet from a, a great poet. And, you know, so that's true here. Elvis, the great original. So this is what Jack said, original for all the copycats. Elvis was a big, fat copycat himself. He was a covers artist, and if you play in bands still, you'll know that being a covers band is just one above being a sound tech. Sorry. <laughs> it's just one above, right? You don't do your own songs. Oh, no, no. He also copied his stuff, whether it's his clothing, which was done by Bernard Lansky, who's the tailor on, on Beale Street, who saw what the hoodlums were wearing in the, the gathering on, uh, in, in Memphis and made their clothes and sold it back to them. You know, just think about it. You know the black leather jumpsuit that Elvis wore on 68 Tour? Some of you will kind of know what I'm talking about there. Ghetto wear, right? And even the white, the Vegas years with the huge collars and the big kick flares, earth, wind, and fire, anyone? <laughs> it's the same shtick, right? It's the same thing. Uh, but even his most famous moment, that in 1954, he was, you know, he breakthrough thing on the Milton Berle show. Uh, and he sang Hound Dog, which was originally a hit for somebody else. It was a Lieber and Stoller song, but it was a hit for, for Big Mama Thornton. And uh, he was, it was this breakthrough because that was when the pelvis first hit the TV screens that shocked America's parents. Um, but this, even this was nicked, stolen, from an act that he'd supported in Vegas. And that act, Freddie Bell and the Bell Boys, used to do Hound Dog. And in the final verse and chorus, he slowed it down to less than half speed, and the pelvis came out. Freddie, bless him. And then Elvis took it and stole it. So even his famous moment was that. His name, of course, is not very original. It's not like a symbol from Prince or, you know, um, Moon Unit from Zappa's Kid. Elvis is a, 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 an ancient, it's an ancient Celtic name. It's been handed down through generations. The church said Elvis is where? Anyone guess? It's in Wales particularly wet bit of Wales, Pembrokeshire, overlooking the Irish Sea, which is normally grey and wet. Um, St Elvis was a 4th century saint who baptised St David, the patron saint of Wales. Innovation is exactly... This is James Watt, who supposedly invented the steam engine. He didn't invent anything. He hacked someone else's design. James Newcomen's engine had been running in, in the steam engine, uh, running in mines in Britain um, for at least um, 50 years. And he just put a condenser on the outside to make it more efficient. Didn't in, copied over the basic mechanics and add a little bit on the side. That's it. So he copied 
and added something to it. So in innovation, it's exactly the same. So here are the things that we've learned from how to copy and create new stuff. And for this, I'm going to need a number of you to come up here. So I need some volunteers. And for once, we're not going to do the very front. But you can join us if you want. Come and stand up here. Go on. Come on, Stephen. Come and join me. And you guys, the next table there. And you ladies, that'd be great. Go on. You guys come and join us as well. Yes, that's it. We need about four more. Four more people. That's great. That's great. Now, could you all turn face that way, please? Here we go. There's a space for you down here. Cool. So what's going to happen is you're going to be tapped on the shoulder by the person behind you. When you get tapped on the shoulder, and only then, turn around. Watch what they do. And then turn around. Tap the person in front of you on the shoulder and show them what you've seen. It's like... It's like Broken telephone game, right? Here we go. Yep. Turn around. That's great. Now, do you, yeah, you show us what you've seen. Go on. Very good. Now, audience, what happened? What happened? They lost it. Oh, that sounds. What side of the agency client divide do you work on? Yeah. <laughs> they lost it. No, there was error introduced. There's variation. Variation through copying. So. Do you want to just move out of the way? No. So it went here we, where there was a slight variation introduced here. The more variation here. By the time it got to you, Stephen, it was just that. And then there was more. And by the time it got down here, it was two. <laughs> to emphasize. Now, thank you. Please sit down. Big round of applause. Um, what we see here. What we see here is this, is that every time humans copy, there's error, mm. variation. And that's a good thing, and excuse me, madam, but not a bad thing. The error is stuff that humans do that machines can't. Machines replicate exactly, and there's no juice in that at all for innovation or for, uh, for insights. Look at, look at Warhol. Warhol used the mechanical means of replication, but it's where stuff's out of register that real value comes. So he copies loosely. And if you want to copy stuff, first of all, work out how you can copy loosely. There are lots of ways you can do that, one of which is to actually accept the accidents that happen. So not feel that you've, you've, you've lost it completely at the first step. It's just a, an accident, and that's great. So when Elvis did his first session in Sun Studios at Sam Phillips on the right, uh, he was mucking around with the guys in the band, and, the, and if you've ever played in a band, you'll know, that, you'll know that the band likes to play as fast as it can, just to wind the singer up, just to make him mad. So they're playing triple time. And uh, they're playing, it's, an, it's an old country rock standard, and they're playing tip, triple time, and Sam Phillips pressed the button on the desk and said, hey guys, what are you up to? And they said, we're just fooling around. He said, no, that's the sound. <laughs> So by accident, they created the sound. Where are the accidents? Are you allowing for accidents in the way that you bring stuff from elsewhere to, or, or you're uh, exploring uh, insights to, uh, to take advantage of accidents like that? Well, that's accidents. That's my band. Um, that's us looking strangely relaxed before a gig, apart from the guy um, who's looking downwards to, towards this end, because he's a stand-in drummer. It's his first gig with us, so he's terrified. Um, Apple use this to teach their design philosophy. So you, they use this Picasso drawings here. Naturalistic drawing, take a bit away. Naturalistic drawing, take a bit away. Take away, take away. So you create error deliberately through it. 
is to take something that you think that could work, remove things. That in itself can be a way of, of, finding, uh, of finding juice here. And you just copy from as far away as you can. Again, Eliot was very good on this, T.S. Eliot. You know, it's, it's how far away you can copy from that shows whether you're a good poet or not. Um, this is Dave Brailsford, who masterminded the Team GB's cycling success at the last Olympics. And his thing was he was a great data guy. So he had all the data about performance you could want. He was a great uh, fitness and um, uh, physiology guy as well. So he had all of that. He had the great technology of the age, but no better really than most of the other teams. What he did, it, what he also had, is he had a number of very small questions which could add up to something big, which weren't directly to do with cycling at all. And they were these. What is it, what things can reduce the performance of our people, given everything else is working perfectly? And what did he land on, do you think? What answers to that kind of question did he land on? Lack of sleep. Excellent. If you're, a, if you're an elite athlete, you're on the road for about 300 days a year, how many nights of those are you going to get a good night's sleep? So he identified the world's best experts in sleep science and built a tailor-made program for each of his elite athletes. And basically, they slept in exactly the same space every night, wherever they went. Just absolutely brilliant. Imagine, all, if, if, even if it gave you two weeks extra at peak, that would be two weeks your competition wouldn't have. Similarly, then he identified that one of the best ways to reduce your performance is to, um, to catch a cold, some respiratory problem or some stomach problem. And there are really simple ways to stop that. So he went around the world and found there's a woman here who has done a lot of work on um, the transmission of those kind of infections through hand touching. And so I ported her knowledge back and taught the British cycling team how to wash their hands. Really weird. But again, two weeks. Imagine two weeks extra that you wouldn't have. Two weeks your competition are gonna have, are gonna miss. So it's from far away. And when you take something far away, you create error because you bring it to a new place. Just like the guys who invented Ian Schrager invented the boutique hotel concept, having done Studio 54, a nightclub, knew nothing about hotels, but ported nightclub model into hotels, which is why I can never find my glasses in those dark, tiny bedrooms that boutique hotels always offer. I don't know anyone else suffers from that. So those are things that are really important. But the best and easiest way to make sure that you use this ability that creative and innovative people have is to ask the Martin kind of question. What kind of thing is this? What kind of thing is it? What kind of thing? It's a bit like the Letterman question. Years ago, Letterman used to do this thing in the, in the days when the internet was something that only junior TV researchers, hello, <laughs> junior TV researchers um, had access to. He'd show something, he'd go, is this a thing or is it nothing? Is it a thing or is it nothing? Is it something you need to pay attention to or is it nothing? It's a similar kind of question. So what kind of thing is it that we're dealing with? And we're going to get practical now. So if, if now you think, oh, I've heard enough of the theory, I'm going to run off for my lunch, then really happy to do that. If you want to stay for the next 20 minutes or so, we're going to now learn how to do this practically. So if you are going to stay, can I ask you to come and join us down here? Because it's going to be more useful for you and more useful for everyone else if you sit at these tables over here. Please. Young man. <laughs> what are you? Great. That's great. Yes, come and join us at the front. It's, it's much nicer down here. Are you going to be looking No, I'm not going to repeat it. No, it's just, this is a whole new section, yeah. This is the practical piece that we're going to do. This is the answer the question so, what do you do differently in order to create new insights? And what uh, it is practical. So if you've got a pad of paper in front of you, 
There's lots of these on the table. I want you to draw this simple diagram. The x-axis goes from independent to copying. The y-axis goes from informed to uninformed. This is not just something I've made up, um, although we did invent it together, borrowing from other stuff. Professor Alex Bentley and I sell, myself uh, developed it originally to do some work with the UK Department of Health back in about 2006, six seven, And it's based on patterns in data that you'll find very clearly. And we're going to get you to use this. This is my answer to so, rather than hope I have a moment like, uh, like Martin Elliott did, watching Formula One and going, that's the thing, that's the kind of problem. This helps you work out what kind of problem much more rapidly, OK? Um, so, gives you four choice styles. Now, this is not a segmentation in the sense that it doesn't describe an individual. This is about the styles that describes a market or a behavior by a population to fit in a particular place. So, for example, if we were to say, generally speaking, fashion might find itself in the copying space. And it's going to be an uninformed choice. We'll go through what these axes mean in a moment, but it just gives you an, a flavor of what we're looking at rather than it's not a segmentation, it's not about individuals, it's about a large number of people so that you can classify that market or that set of behavior by a population. Um, if you want to know more, uh, it's in the book, uh, but also in it's the center of I'll Have What She's Having, the previous book, and there's a great paper by. Alex Bentley, Mike O'Brien from Missouri State, and uh, Bill Brock from, uh, I think Bill is from Wisconsin. Bill, uh, Buzz Brock is one of the great economists, great economists who should get a Nobel Prize, but he won't because he doesn't care and likes to live where he lives, in Madison. <laughs> he's great. He's, uh, he's extraordinary. They've, they've had a number of articles um, published, including in the probably after Science and Nature, the best social science um, journal, which is brain and behavior science. Uh, anyway, so we're going to have a look at that. This is my answer to that question. So how do you know uh, what kind of thing it is? And to do this, could you all stand up then? We're going to play a little quiz. This is the x-axis. This is the x-axis. So if you think uh, one of these behaviors by population is independent choice, put your hand on your head. If you think it's going to be copying or social choice, then putting you behind. Head. For independent, behind for, uh, sorry, head for independent, behind for copy. First one then, music. The music we listen to, the music we download, the music we stream, the music some of us occasionally pay for. Is that an independent choice or a social one? If you've got your hands on your head, you can sit down. I wish it were. I wish it were about, it, about the quality of the thing and about really, a, Susan Boyle is my answer to you. <laughs> she got lucky. Lots of some great work done by Duncan Watts and Max Halganik, who is at Princeton, um, uh, which demonstrates very clearly uh, from a number of experiments that it's a social thing. It's sad. I've wasted too much of my life on music, and it's nothing to do with the thing. I'm afraid it's what other people do. Drink, then. Gareth, you should know this, doing a lot of drinks clients, haven't you? Is drink an independent choice or is it a social one? The drinks we drink, is it an independent choice or a social one? A social one? What do you think, sir? Is it neither? Social? Correct, it's a social one. So why, tell me, do the French persist in this nonsense in the wine trade of the terroir, the particular place, the soil, the sun, the rain, the wind, which creates a unique flavor that actually in blind taste tests nobody can discern. <laughs> it's just bollocks. It's marketing nonsense is what it is. It met in the late 19th century just to, to uh, improve the chances of the French wine industry, which was then in trouble. Also why, uh, if you've ever worked with drink clients, there's a lot of stuff about the unique flavor profile. I think that's good because we have to do product testing repeatedly and competitive product testing and then go to do bar visits. Gareth smiling now. So there we are. Um, so yes, it's that social, definitely. Now, um, I couldn't find an icon which said auto insurance <laughs> or home insurance, but the umbrella and the rain is the best I could do. So is that an independent choice or a social choice? Independent or social? 
auto insurance. Which brand you choose? Yeah. Social or independent? Independent or social? Okay, so if you've got your hands on your behind, you can sit down. Patterns in the data are really clear. And I talked about patterns before. We won't, we won't labour this, but uh, if you've got a long-tail distribution of popularity in a market, that famous long tail of Chris Anderson's, that tends to be a signal of social. If it's a short tail, like we see in Andrew Ehrenberg's Dirichlet and lots of FMCG, CPG categories, that tends to suggest that it's independent. Uh, and that's what we see in most insurance markets, domestic insurance markets. Also, just think about it this way. How many choices are there to be had? How many brands to choose from? Thousands, right? Mm -hmm. Thousands. How many dimensions are there on which you might evaluate those? There's, there's lots of dimensions you could, but, but mostly you do it the one I heard from, right? The one that mailed me last, the one I've used before, the one I've heard of. Even when you use one of those comparison websites, that's just to make it easier so you go, yeah, of those three, that one, <laughs> heard of them. But it's, uh, so it's largely independent. What about deodorant format? We're now down to the finalists, this is good. Deodorant format, so it's roll-on stick, uh, aerosol, crystal, whatever you like. Is that gonna be an independent choice or a social choice? Independent choice or a social choice? You sit down, sir. It's in fact very much very, very much uh, an independent choice. Every year, somebody at Unilever or Colgate or P&G goes, I've just spotted the margins on aerosols are nearly twice those on roll-ons. It's got all our roll-on users to trade up to aerosols. I'll be CMO by Christmas. And it never works. And it never works because people like the roll-on. You, you know, however loyal you say you are to a brand, you just switch to, to another variant, another brand that gives you that same format. Okay, so we have to separate you now, down to three. Cameras. Choosing a camera, is it an independent choice or is it a social choice? Social, yeah, what do you think Sony might say, who make cameras, or Nikon might say? Think about what their marketing communication tells us. Mm -hmm. Megapixels, super zoom. It's all about the thing, as if choosing the thing on its own not important at all. Whether you're looking at high-end cameras or low-end cameras, it's about social, so you're absolutely right. Um, and then, finally, laptops. Laptops. Is that an independent choice or a social one? Oh, you're all, all together there, fantastic. So it is primarily the number of SKUs in the average uh, developed market for laptops is three and a half thousand. Three and a half thousand choices you have. Too many, right? So most people either get given what they get given, accept what they get given, or they buy a brand, which is social, fundamentally. Which is why Apple, lovely Apple, it's an easy choice to make. They look pretty, and then. Or if you're a gamer, Acer. ASOS, both of those things are really good. Your community knows it. So it's a social thing as well. Um, and that's a way to make the decision easy. Three and a half thousand choices. No, I'll have one of those. Can't go wrong. I don't care if it's worth, if it's four, five, six, ten times as much as the basic product. It's just easy. Easy choice to make. So that's the X dimension. The Y dimension is uh, something we don't normally think about. Most of the time we think about choices. And this is true of decision science generally. We, sorry. Three of you, well done. Come and see me afterwards, I have a present for you. Um, so, uh, this dimension is, we'd normally think of choices A versus B versus C. Partly because, you know, our, our background in decision science tends to be shaped a lot by um, classical, eco classical economics, where we're considering utilities of A versus B versus C. But the truth is, most markets are now faced, as the bottom would face, with thousands of choices, just too much. It's not accounted for a lot. And so informed is, is, is sort of a derivative from uh, economics as if you had information about that market. And uninformed makes it hard to discern quality or discern value or discern um, anything at all about them. So that's that dimension. And um, 
What this does then is lead to this very simple map. It's a very, very simple map which goes, consider choice in the Northwest. Quality is clear, the product, the features, function and costs. It's what we call in Britain a better mousetrap. That's what's essential in that strategy, in that, uh, in that type of choice. Bottom there, bottom left, southwest, guesswork. Hard to see the difference between A, B, C, D, E, F, G, repeat to Z. Things that, decision styles that become really important here. Habit, CPG markets are driven by habit. Availability, and salience, offers. If you're addicted to promotional activity, then that's where your market is. And then on the eastern side of the map, experts and authorities. This means quality can or um, sometimes cannot be uh, discerned easily. Recommendations and usage by experts and authorities of various sorts are important. Traditions and social norms are also really important here. So in the UK, there's a very strange belief that Heinz as a business and Heinz as a brand is a British brand. It's as British as British can be, as British as roast beef, which is nonsense. Clearly, we all know factually it's not true, but, but we think it's, the, think it's the case. Social identities and social structures are really important here. So this is what we use. We see this a lot in you know, teenage tribes and so on. So that's a really important thing. And then finally, copying peers. This is an underrated sector because it's um, an underrated type of choice because it doesn't seem like a proper choice. It seems like it's not, you're not taking the decision seriously. But we use it an awful lot. It's, I'll have what she's having writ large. When it's hard to see the difference, what you look for is what's popular here and now, the people around you, maybe what famous people use. It's a celebrity, it's a shorthand for popularity sometimes. And what you hear more and more about, so where there's buzz. Does that make sense? Now, clearly, you can nuance this map more than that, but what it does very quickly is go, what kind of thing am I dealing with? If I'm, as, as worked with Sony in the past, on cameras and other uh, consumer electronics, if they think it's up here in the Northwest, as most manufacturers think that their markets are up here, and you go, no, it's not. <laughs> Your market is, in fact, over here in the Northeast. Immediately, there's a big insight there. You need a different kind of way forward. You need to think about different things. You need to have a different kind of focus for your marketing activity and, and stop being so worried about megapixels and how fast you zoom. If you discover that everyone else in your market is delivering what's exactly appropriate to that particular space, then you might need to think of some other spaces to change the decision, how that might work. So it's a simple map. Now, I'm not expecting you to remember all of that, so I'll flash it up in a couple of times in a moment. But it does, because it's database as well, it's a really useful shorthand. And just draw it, you know, when you next think about what a market looks like, characterize it quickly. Hmm. Now, in every market, some people will be different. Just as Everett Rogers' diffusion curve had a few people at the front, about 2.5% to 3 If that went to 4%, the curve would look very different. If it went down to one5 it would look very different again. So a small number of people can be important, but don't worry about it too much, because again, the patterns and the data are there. And this is a thinking tool, not a descriptive tool. Help you do the thinking quicker, and therefore dig out an insight quicker. <coughs> so we ask what kind of thing, and I developed a set of cards, I help you do this. What kind of thing is this? And once you know what kind of thing, just like with our man, Martin Elliott, we're able to go, what kind of strategy solved that kind of problem? What kind of things have other people done in other markets to effectively address that kind of decision style? It's not the whole answer to your problems. It's not the only place you get an insight from. But if you do this repeatedly, you start to get very quickly much closer to how people choose and solutions that are novel and interesting uh, to the consumer and to yourself and your clients. Let's have a look at this. And has, does anyone use these kind of wearables, Fitbits and so on? I'm, I'm a proud owner too. Where do you think on our map Fitbit lives? And I want you to do is a couple of minutes just to talk with the people on the table where you think it might be. Draw yourself another set of axes where it might be. I mean, copying the form. Yeah, I, I How are people choosing in this kind of market? Yes. Yeah, 
But I think very soon it'll just be these people. Yeah, yeah, because it's too complicated. So we're thinking. Yes. That the and mark it on the map. These things starts here. How do you think they're choosing? To their friends, and very soon you know, the next generation of buyers will be copiers because they're looking for the results and the stories, not the specifications and the technology. Yeah, we would start. I mean, so many people. This is every, you know most. To me, it's here. But um, like, just because it's such a social craze, you know, sitting is the new smoking, the whole thing. Sitting is the new smoking. How are people choosing in this market? So thoughts. Ladies at the back there, what do you reckon? Yeah, yeah. You get your uninformed copying of your peers. Yep. Mm -hmm. Great. Great. So mark that on the map. So that would be southeast, right? What else? What about you guys? What do you think? Southeast, yeah. Okay, cool. Where did you mark put it? Mostly southeast. We had two thoughts. Okay, good. In an, in an early market, when you're gaining traction for these devices, yep. it's, it's informed. It's more technical, more experimentation. Mm -hmm. You have to have a, your own. You have to find your own desire for it. But mm -hmm. very quickly, that spills over to your friends, family, yeah, yeah. colleagues. So southeast is the winner. That's when the companies make money. Yeah, no, absolutely. Where do you think the manufacturer <laughs> thinks it lives? <laughs> I'm sorry. What did you ask? The manufacturer. Where do you think the manufacturer imagines people are choosing? Northwest. Mm -hmm. Northwest. And this is, to your point entirely, the chasm between the very first people to adopt this thing and the manufacturer <laughs> and the rest of us. You know, to that so, point, Apple has done very well in defining its products in the Northwest, but it markets them almost exclusively. Bingo. Exactly right. Exactly right. Apple are brilliant at not uh, at using the power of people. I, last week was Dub Dub, their Worldwide Developers Conference. Mm -hmm. 5,000 tickets sold. It's one of the most influential things on their share price. It's extraordinary. There were about, I was told, 150,000 people streamed in for all other things. It's just wow. extraordinary. And they have, um, they have more than a million app developers whose business future is dependent on them. So the social thing is really, really, really important. So that's interesting. So we've immediately got a gap between what the manufacturer thinks. and So that's an insight to start with. What kind of strategies do you think are going to work in that space then? What kind of things might you go for? Celebrities, Celebrities is one. Yep. Yeah. What about what Apple did with their music products? originally with iPod, those terrible white earpieces, the world's worst earpieces if you like music. <laughs> Just terrible. Just terrible. But they're really good for Apple because they're social signals. They they're a sign of popularity, which is why also that the, you know, the, the silhouette campaign that they ran around the world said exactly, exactly that. Popularity, popularity, popularity. Can you bake that in? Can you do also, another strategy might be to make do what the Mars Corporation does, bless them. When they go into any confectionery, confectionery outlet, and they go, we're going to re-merchandise this so that you can't see the competition. <laughs> Ours will appear to be the most popular. Let's do one more, and then we, uh, we'll continue the conversation afterwards uh, for those, those of you strong enough without lunch. So this is, this is the equivalent of the IRS. Tax authorities. How do you get people, is the challenge, how do you get people to change their behavior so that they complete and file their tax return on time. You threaten them. <laughs> OK, so yeah, so that's the big question. The big brief from the client is, how do you get them to do it? The first question that we ask is, where does the choice to file or not live on our map? Guess where? where on our map does it live?
For those of you who've just joined us, this is the map we're talking about. Oh. So what do we think? Southwest. So explain that. You just do it, and you just don't do it, and you just don't do it, and you just don't do it. So what? So the first suggestion here of an intervention presumes something else, right? Which is that these people are making a decision not to do this. But you're saying it's a habit which just goes on, and we just don't do it, and we just don't do it, just don't do it. I think that's more accurate, to be honest. But it's nice that we all feel that we just punish the buggers. <laughs> Where did you put it? Where did the decision now, not to file or not to file? Well, personally, um, it feels like guesswork. Yep. It's such an overwhelming system. And it forces me, Northeast, to hire somebody to make me feel better. That's right. That's right. And neither of those are voluntary. I feel befuddled. That's exactly right. So what we've got from immediately understanding where we think it is, and guesswork is the right place, a lot of financial services are people going, now that one, that one, that one. Yeah, all right. You mailed me. Seems a good offer. You're at the bank. You must know. Even though we know that they've got their own interest and they're not giving us necessarily the best advice in the world. It's guesswork. Whatever. Salience, availability, all that stuff. Solutions are unlikely to be in, the t in punitive, though. They're unlikely to be in the, in the northwest. They like to be somewhere else, in the social side. Intuit, for example, lovely people at Intuit have worked with local church networks to create tax filing parties. Sounds like a really strange thing to do, but it's a social thing, again. Make it easier for people by seeing other people doing it too. Lots of other mechanics there. So, listen, we've come to the end of the time. I'm going to be around for the next 48 hours. But I wanted to leave you with this thought, which is if you know, get to the end, if you know what kind of thing you're dealing with, then you can ask what kind of solution might be better. And that's an insight. Because an insight isn't a description. An insight is something that's orientated towards action really quickly. I'm happy to play a game of cards with you. I've got these, all these hundred and so strategies on a set of cards. They're really quite fun. Um, but unless you know that, you're shooting in the dark. Just because Steve Jobs chose a strategy doesn't make it good for your problem. Ask yourself, one, what kind of problem is this? Two, what kind of solution would be appropriate? And remember that being human, like consumers, means we're never alone. We can use the brains and the behavior and the experience and the knowledge of anyone else, so long as we set out to do it properly. And here's uh, another view of Grayson Perry in his party frog. Originality is people with short memories. Why leave all these ideas that are lying around on the floor just sitting there when you could use them as insights for your particular challenge? Thank you very much. <laughs>